So um, what people think about this, do you have any examples about um, these beliefs or, or do you have any disbeliefs around it? How do you coach? What's, um, have you checked my energy game? What do you think about emotional agility? What do you think about uh, serving leaders? What do you think about empowering your players to have a voice in the changing room? Yeah, I'll kick us off, guys. Um, Eddie, thanks for that. That was that was a really good explanation of your philosophy and uh, the intricacies of it. I, I think a few things that I've noted here is about, you mentioned about the elite environments and how we're still professionals, or particularly yourself, we're still aiming to be winning games and having a like a high performance culture and output. But then, of course, what you're bringing to us here is the idea of opening up sharing the emotions, sharing things that are maybe affecting us off the pitch and our, our feelings, our thoughts. So I guess uh, the question I have is like, how do you find that balance between trying to strive towards us, you know, going after our outcomes and our objectives as, as a team, but also making sure that everyone, like you say, is, is feeling comfortable and secure in themselves, ready to perform? How, how do you find that balance? That's a very good question. And I think the balance is by um, understanding what's needed in every single moment of the day. So there is moments in the day, you are, in the, you are, for example, on the grass and we are doing a drill about finishing skills and you have to demand that it has to go on target. And for example, a very idiotic example, but it's kind of like, there is there, there is no indaba. There is no washi washi. I mean, there is, we are doing a finishing skill and we want to score goals and we need to make sure that we are going to demand from each other. So. The thing is, is being very authentic and very honest in every single moment of the training sessions and every single moment of the day. And for me, the most important thing is to actually embody what you say. So when you go into the changing room and you demand the standards and that's it, the players are going to understand it and they are not going to take it as um, command or guided discovery or anything like that. They're just going to take it as this guy cares for us. This guy is always next to us this guy always does his best to try to help us yes it's right we need to obviously um up our standards and we need to do this or but then you go for lunch and then you are a bit more social you can have a coffee with them you can relax i think it's just being true to who you are i think sometimes um i've been in environments where because it's elite because it's high performance we felt that we have to be on edge every single second. And I don't think there is that need. I think there is the need to demand the standards, to be responsible, to be true to our values, to make sure that we embody our values and to make sure that what we preach is what we do. That is no negotiables. But then you can relax. You can be a person. You know, you can just chill. You can be human. And then, the, so I suppose the right answer to your question in my mind is there is always a moment for everything in during the day. And there's moments where it's like, listen, there's no negotiables. We've agreed on this and this is what's happening. And we are not going to diverse the course and we're going to stay on track. But there is all other moments where you can just chill a little bit and then, you know, give people an opportunity to calm down and to reflect. Because if you are constantly on edge, you're not capable of reflecting. If you're not reflecting, you're never going to question what you do. And if you don't question what you do, you're never going to progress. And if there is no progression, there is no development. And if there is no development, there is no enhancing, um, there is not enhancing performance. Therefore, I would say there is no elite environment. There is no high performance. So high performance environments do request to have moments of reflection and reflection can only happen when we lower the temperature and we give ourselves an opportunity to listen to each other. Um, if we are constantly on edge, probably you'll never get to that state and you will never have that important reflection of and questioning and, 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 and curiosity of challenge what you do. You will only do Yes, you'll be on edge. Yes, everything you do, you'll probably do it 100% and you'll probably do it amazingly well. But is what you do on a daily basis good enough every day? Because things evolve. And, you know, if 
throughout the course of the season, you're constantly doing the same. Listen, your rivals, your opponents might change. They might get better. They might do things differently. They might use all their strategies. Maybe your best performance under the ideas that you implemented on day one are not good enough now to beat your opponent. And that, those questions can only be raised in your mind and in the group if there is moment of reflection. I like that. Uh, what yeah. comes to mind when you, as you were saying that about kind of turning on and off is, is like the idea of sharpening the saw. So yeah. if you're kind of like constantly, you know, going at it hundred miles per hour, you're going to lead to burnout. I'm sure like your, your, your performance will be great for a while, but ultimately, I mean, you know, it's gonna, there's going to be like burnout that builds up. And, you know, as you said, if you're, if your performance is going down, you can you can best bet that your opposition's opponents sorry your uh, opponent's performance is uh, surpassing yours so what comes to mind is extreme on and extreme off to allow for that space exactly and we all know as well i mean it's nothing new now in, in sports science and strength and conditioning strategies and so on that recovery is super super important from a physical point as well yeah and so if recovery strategies are so important from a physical perspective why wouldn't we give a chance to recover from a mind perspective. We also need, in a way, to kind of like allow ourselves to settle a little bit up here, not just in, you know, physically. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, uh, well, there's there's an argument, isn't there, that like the, the body does what the mind is, is feeling and thinking. So if, if you're kind of tense, you're going to perform and behave in that way. Whereas, exactly. you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, you know, this is a central part of your thing. Like if, if you're relaxed, you're going to perform a lot better. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I call it I call it a, a behavior that doesn't allow added pressure. So the game is already it does it, the game and the competition already creates a pressure which is healthy and good. However, the added pressure that you put on top of that by certain behaviors and certain mindsets is the one which is not healthy, and that is the pressure we need to try to get rid of. Yeah. The other pressure is actually very, very good because it keeps you on point. It gets you on your toes mm -hmm. and it keeps you, you know, in that, in that healthy edge of, oof, I need to do my best. And that kind of like, that is a positive um, demand from your body. Um, the other one is just an added pressure that you put in your mind because you haven't been able to d do that exactly. What you just said, switch off and just lower it a little bit. Just, just, just talk on that for me, if you could, like the differences in, in, in the kind of like energy levels. So you just talked about like almost good energy, bad energy. So getting ready for performance and maybe the way, the way your body is like preparing to go out onto the pitch yeah. versus, you know, maybe having some negative thought patterns about, you know, poor performance of the past. What, how, how do you see that, the, the differences between the two? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's a great question. And maybe I haven't explained myself with the pressure I haven't expressed myself well enough because I don't believe in duality. It's not like there is good or bad energy. Okay. Uh, it's not so much about duality. It's more about how you transform that energy. So basically it's about, it's about making sure that you are so level to yourself that you know how to behave depending on the situation. And, and that's what I call true energy. So, when you are very aligned, so basically being aligning your uh, thoughts, words, behaviors, actions. The right. minute you are capable to make an alignment with those four things, then you will always create the right energy for the right moment. It's not that there is a good or a bad energy mm -hmm. as such. It's more that you need to have the right levels of energy depending on the situation and the context. You wouldn't talk to a child the same way you would talk to an adult, depending on you. You wouldn't talk in a university lecture the way the same way you would talk in a changing room with the lads. And so, as well as you can modulate that, and it's not right or wrong, it's just how you modulate that. Same is with energy. It's not that there is a good or bad energy. Is that you know how to pitch it depending right. on the context, and that's with the four uh, things that I've just said in terms of alignment words um sorry thoughts words behaviors actions yep 
Perfect. Guys, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to, to leave them in the chat. Um, so just on alignment then, how, how do you see players get, getting into that process, getting into that uh, sense of alignment? Because maybe uh, I've been listening to you, your podcast with you and your, your guys. Sure. Um, you guys have mentioned the, the concept of awareness. So yes. I think if, if you don't have awareness, it's very difficult to get aligned with, you know, what needs to happen, what, where you're trying to go. So yeah. what techniques have you guys been using with your players or even for other coaches to, to find that awareness in order to get that alignment? Yeah. So uh, actually, it might be worth showing you a couple of things. Okay. So, um, so when I do the individual development plan with the players, I already start thinking about personality traits, mindset, habits. And then when you think about those things, you're already creating an awareness because you're already asking them to think about things that normally in a football context, they wouldn't. Normally in a football context is more about, okay, targets for technique, targets for tactical, targets for physical, and maybe targets for psychological and social. But that's it because obviously they follow the four, the, the four corner model from the FA, but which is really good by the way. I'm nothing against that. But what I'm saying is that we try or I try to go deeper so I try to work with them in saying, okay, give me some personality traits about yourself. Some players might prefer to do a personality test. That's fine by me. But I prefer if they come up with their own personality traits. So things like I'm an organizer, I'm an energizer, I'm a thinker, I'm a warrior. I'm different things that they might believe that they are. And then in that way, now you can create certain targets and action plans around those personality, personality traits. Now, straight away, without them realizing it, they are starting to be aware about who they are and what kind of energy they emanate as a player and as a person in the changing room. Then, obviously, we link that with the mindset and then we link that with the habits. So, again, now we are having that alignment that I've just said about thoughts, words, uh, behaviors and actions. And, and so it's... It's not like you are kind of like guiding them without them knowing, but you are kind of obviously giving them certain methodology within your processes. Mm. Then this is the model. So this is the model I've created with the methodology behind my energy game, right? Which is step in, dial in, warm up, build on, level out. And again, raising awareness of your own energy. So this is something I would also present to the players. And I'll say, when we are doing the IDP, the Individual Development Plan, I'll say, guys, this might help you. Okay, we this half, this side of the Individual Development Plan, the one which is a bit more different to the ones that you may have done in the past, which is more about personality, and it's more about mindsets and habits and behaviors, could be implemented by this. Have you thought about how you can raise awareness of your own energy? Have you thought about how to find peace and joy in the now? What kind of things are you reading? What kind of things do you do away from football? How do you relate to your friends and your family? What kind of hobbies do you have? Time management. How do you organize your timetable? What kind of things you do in a, in a weekly, in a daily basis? And that, by asking all of those questions with the IDP and with this, you will then generate a certain degree of awareness. Yep. And, and of course, then techniques. A thousand and one. I mean, there. You know, but it will again. It will depend on the player because you mm. have to try to work on uniqueness. What mm. works for you doesn't work for me, and vice versa. Mm. Some people might go into the mindfulness, might go more into yoga, meditation, tai chi, um, um, a walk in nature, things like that. Other people might prefer conversations with their family, with their mates, or they might, you know, they might find other type of strategies, but. The most important thing to make people aware is to start generating a different thought pattern. And that can be achieved as simply as having that IDP where straight away, most of them go and ask, what's this? What's personal, personality trait? That, that, that's never been, you know, I've been, uh, I've been playing football for 10 years. I've, I've got 300 games under my belt in, in, in professional football. And no one has asked me about my personal traits. Are you trying to dispute who I am? Are you trying to say, you know, 
do I have a problem? Those are the generic questions that you get asked. And by the way, rightly so. I mean, I have no problem with those questions. They are really good questions. But straight away, though that that's already creating a certain degree of awareness because it's like, well, if this guy who is my coach and he's working on my IDP is asking me about my personality traits and he's asking me about this and this and this, well, there's something here. Whether it's good, bad, they like it or not, there is already a thought process. And when you challenge the thought process of anyone, by definition, you're going to affect one way or another, you're going to affect their thought process. And the minute the thought process is, um, I was going to say compromise, that's probably not the right word, but the, it's challenge. Yep. Then we go back to the same point. Thought, mm-hmm. words, actions, so behaviors, actions. Therefore, you've already created, you, you've already changed the first bit. And by having a different thought pattern, you will have a different behavior and a different action because yeah. actions and behaviors come from your thoughts, come from your minds, come from that starting point. So that's how you can start challenging and changing um, your awareness. Mm. Brilliant. That was really good. Um, do you find that the, some players take to these these concepts, these ideas a little bit quicker, a little bit more um, proactively perhaps than others who are perhaps a little bit more guarded? You gave a little example there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like in anything, I mean, absolutely. Um, there are people who are now very, um, how can I say, they are, they're starting to be much more in line to mindfulness and mm. the importance of those things in a competitive elite environment and to enhance the performance. And on other people that haven't been educated in that manner, haven't had that cultural change yet, and therefore they're more resistant. And that's fair. That's fine. It's not a problem. Um, but I always say to the players that, listen, I'm not here to tell you what to believe in or what to do. I'm just giving you guidance and I'm just giving you options. And then you just have to choose whatever it works for you. Now, if you don't want to do this bit, and if that's, that's fine by me. I mean, it's not like, you know, again, that goes back into the first point that, we, that I made when I was giving you a little bit of my ideas is that I, do, I don't impose things. I mean, what I do is trying to open their minds to more possibilities and and try to make them aware that understanding yourself is definitely going to help you to become a better player, definitely. Because the minute you understand yourself better, you know what you need. And the minute you know what you need, you can ask for that need. And someone can cover it or you can cover it yourself. But if you don't understand yourself, you don't know what needs you have. If you don't know what needs you have, how can you know how to progress? It's like something that would be so clear in technique work. Well, if you don't know the key factors of how to kick the ball, how to strike the ball in the right manner or in a much more effective manner, if you don't know how to break down the technique and the key factors of each point, probably you want to strike the ball in an effective way. So same, same with your mind. If you don't know your needs, if you don't know yourself enough, if you don't understand your, yourself enough, how can you help yourself to train your mind, your mind to be able to then you know, enhance your performance? But again, it's, 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 not, it's opening the minds yeah. and, and there is no preaching. It's like, well, the player thinks that you know, works for them uh, and, and there is no rights or wrongs. There is just loads of other possibilities that they need to understand whether they want to do or they don't want to do. Um, yeah. I'm very comfortable, very, very comfortable with the players doing what they think is best for them. Um, I'm not here to tell them uh, what to do. I'm here to try to open their minds. Fascinating. Okay, question from Amin. Uh, let me just scroll up just a sec. Okay, so... How a 15 to 19 age group player, or how would, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that age age uh, group player, how would you adapt to, or how would you get them to adapt to a different thought pattern if they've had uh, a previous one that's incorrect? So perhaps maybe conflicting. Yeah. So again, same um, with 15, 16 years old, 
same, I would probably have an Indaba and I would probably create that circle of trust, um, whether it's in the changing room, whether it's on the page. And then I very openly and very authentically and you know, without going around the houses, I would say, guys, what are your beliefs in this? Or how do you think about this? And what's going through your minds? And I think with the right questions and the right um, atmosphere within the Indava, they will give you enough to start then creating and generating um, a debate around it. And then that debate will generate techniques that you can then uh, use and things that you can do and new behaviors within the changing room. But I think when you do that, not only you are raising awareness, but you're also empowering your players to come up with their own uh, set of rules. Now, in pre-season, I always have um, a first meeting with the players to say, listen, this is what I believe we may do, but I want the buying from the people. And I think that to get the buying, you have to have an honest, honest conversation. And with 15s and 16s, I have coached 15s and 16s. Funny enough, yesterday I was doing training sessions for the under 16s at the Palace. And they are very, very aware of conversations and, and they are very comfortable with an honest conversation if it's conducted in a manner that they feel that is going to help them. I think the key factor with anything is that the player sees that everything you do, rightly or wrongly in their eyes, it's for them. Mm. Now, I, that's why I always say I have no problems with players thinking that I'm wrong because I'm not here to convince them. I, I have a problem when players think that I'm not there for them because then I'm not doing right. My, uh, then I, I'm not doing my job properly. Um, it's you will never be liked by everyone, and uh, you not all of them will think that your your ideas are super cool. But you you they deep down, they all should know that you are there for them. Yeah. And if that's the case, even if they don't want to admit it verbally, <laughs> but even if if that's the case, you've got a winning team. Yeah. Awesome. All right, that was brilliant. Another question coming from Lee, Leo, Lee. I hope I said that right, mate. Okay, so Edu, you raised a terrific point of creating a positive and welcome environment for the club to build upon and grow throughout the season. How would a coach at a new club establish this culture and environment while maintaining some sense of assertiveness? Good question. Okay, how would a coach at a new club establish this culture and environment while maintaining some sense of assertiveness? Yeah, really good question because... Um, Let's let's face it, or let's let's be honest. I don't. I never, you know, I never kind of like. Uh, I always want to see the the elephant in the room, and, and I'll go and I'll go straight into it. So I have no problem to to admit um, the issues of 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 what I'm saying. Um, yes, when you are very empathetic and very compassionate, and when you are serving leader, especially in certain cultures in certain football clubs you might be seen as someone weak, as a leader who is not going to be there to solve problems or is going to be weak when problems arise. Um, so assertiveness for me is you never change the course. So what you said on day one, you still do on day 73. Now, um, it's much easier to implement a leadership based on dictatorship is much easier to gain the respect of your players if it's constantly command and what I say goes much easier. But I think in the medium long term might not generate as much um, uh, development and as much growth as a more uh, compassionate, empathetic uh, leadership can give you. So when you go into a new club and you want to establish this new philosophy and this new culture, I think number one priority must be listen. Listen. Listen first. You cannot go there and change everything on day one if they are not ready to change. Because then you are being not empathetic and compassionate. <laughs> You are just 
thinking that your ideas are very empathetic and very compassionate. You are thinking that your ideas might help them, but you are putting your ego in the way because actually you are starting to behave like those dictators that actually think that because they are right, we need to do this. So, so if, even if your ideas are really cool and really empathetic, actually your behaviors are not aligned with, with your ideas because your behavior is actually being, we must do this and we need to change that. So let's not forget that sometimes even empathetic and compassionate people can not do serving leadership, can actually be also dictators because they think that they are right. And so it's important that you listen on day one. It's important that you see what's the possibility of growth in that team um, and what's the time that you're going to need to do so. And then when, and also to understand what they've been doing and what has worked from what they've been doing. So it's not a case of changing for the sake of changing. It's not a case to thinking that you need to go there to rescue them or save them. You know what I mean? It's more about, well, I want to know how you do things, how it works and doesn't work, and let's then from there work from it. So the ideas of being, so if your question is that, how would you then establish this culture in a club? Basically, you establish a culture of empathy by being empathetic, by listening, but not imposing, but making sure that, you know, you give them some breathing space and breathing time to buy into the ideas and to see the importance of those ideas. Um, and I think that takes longer than, as I said, that takes longer than, than we do this, but I think that's the way you, you transform culture. Um, otherwise you are just imposing certain degree of culture um, but the day you leave you know what it's going to be replaced by someone else's um, you know what I mean because the only thing you've done is just imposing so for me it's also important legacy and, and to contribute with certain legacy in football clubs um, like in, in companies I think it's about listening and I, I think it's about making sure for example I'll give you an example now Crystal Palace uh, where I am now um proud of being from South London, very multicultural club, really, you know, vibrant, people from different places, from different ethnicities, religions. So how wonderful it's just to go there on day one and listen to those people and listen what we are about. And then the minute you start listening to them and then you see the value of this, you see the value of that. Now we've now, four months, five months down the line, we've now changed most of the APP most of the academy plan for certain things. But the change has been very organic and it's been contributed by everyone because everyone has felt empowered to do these changes. Why? Because you've given them a platform to, you know, to voice their opinions. So that's how you, um, for, in my opinion, that's how you create culture. And again, that's not my culture. That's not, you know, that the only thing I've done is gone there, listen and try to empower people and tell them that, you know, I like that or I don't like that or, you know, I'm being very authentic. And I think that's how you can create culture by, by listening and, and by, by creating an environment in where people feel empowered. Um, it's not about you going there and rescue anyone. You go in there and tell them and teaching them how it's done. Um, you know, I think the beauty of each football club, like any nation, any club, any backgrounds, any is is being, being true to who they are. Um, and I think coaches, we need to see that. We need to go into a club and understand who they are, what they are about, and listen to them to be able then to contribute to the culture. Quality, yeah. I think it's like a, almost being a facilitator for what's already there and, and allowing the best parts of that to come forward and, and form something collectively strong. Exactly. I mean, when people ask me, best trait of a coach, the answer is, I don't know, because, you know, it depends on your uniqueness as a person. But definitely a very important trait of a coach is inspire. And inspiration is based on allowing people to be true to who they are. Perfect. All right. Another question. Uh, what would you consider the best approach to align individual objectives towards team goals? Good. Very good question. Um, 
for me is when you go back into the um, IDP, making sure that you always anchor some of his or her um, individual plan and individual objectives within the team. So in that way, you are already creating a common ground. And then um, it's very important as well that um, players understand that there is a duty for their own development, but also a duty to the team and vice versa. And there is this conflict, you know, by being a good teammate, am I going to lose out in my own development and my own strategies? By focusing too much on my own strategies and on my own objectives, I might become a bad teammate because I'm not going to be there for them. And there is now a win-win scenario. I mean, there will always be a conflict. But I think the most important thing as a coach to facilitate that is to be honest and say, okay, this is your individual development plan. Let's work on it. So this is what we need to do for you to be at your best. And this is what the team requires from you. But ultimately, you being at your best helps the team. The team doing these things and you following these things might help you as well. So it's always that honesty and that connection and making sure that one of their objectives connects with the team objective. What, this objective connects with this other. Um, so score 20 goals. That's one of your objectives. Um, obviously, then you will have the key factors and the, and the action plan how to achieve that. But let's say score 20 goals. Now, how can the team help you to do that? Okay, is our um, style of play helping you? Yes. Do we need to change a little bit our style of play to help you out? Well, let's see whether by changing it, we can help you and not compromise others. And it's always a negotiation. I think, I think coaches have to be very good at negotiating um, and, and, and convincing players that um, that negotiation is for their benefit as much as for the teams. So it's, it's like a fine dance between that, you know, what's best for the team and then what's best for the individual. And exactly. it's kind of very Exactly. And, and, and it will, I mean, invariably, I mean, it will always require compromise. It will always require compromise. It's like, if I am very passionate about my job and I give a loads of, hour, loads of hours to my job, family is going to struggle. <laughs> family time is going to struggle. If I offer too much time, to, not too much, but if I offer a lot of time to my family and my personal life, I might not, obviously, I, I might not do well in my job because I haven't put the focus on my job. What's best? What's, yeah. So it always requires compromise, negotiation, and it always mm. requires honesty. Yeah. I mean, like, it's like each decision just has its own consequences. It, it just can't be avoided. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. I wanted to ask, um, wh where did the, where did the inspiration or the, the, the knowledge for Indaba, where did that come from? Where, how did that come across? Cause it's not exactly a common reference. Yeah. I mean, Indaba came from uh, a couple of conversations with my very good friend, Stephen Rolnick. Stephen Rolnick is a psychologist, father of motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing is a strategy, is a psychological strategy to help people to raise awareness of their needs by asking a set of questions, which, is, which are always going to be about what they say. Um, so similar to clean language. And so basically having a conversation with Stephen, he was the one who said, that was already a few years ago, said, Ed, have you ever thought about doing this? And this is what I've been um, investigating because he's from South Africa. Okay. So this is what I've been investigating about different tribes in Africa. And this is what the Zulus do. And, and yeah, we, we, we tried it. We tested it. It worked. Um, the first time we, we did it, he came. The first time okay. I did it with, with uh, MK Dons already four or five years ago. And, and, and the boys loved it. And yeah, from there we've adopted it, and, and obviously we've refined it a little bit. And yeah, it's, it's it's that's 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 basically where it comes from, and that's why I started to implement it. So basically, I shouldn't take any credit from it. It's more Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. We'll uh, we'll make sure we shout out Stephen when whenever we bring it up. Uh, okay, question again. How about starting an internal competition between individuals? As once our coach said, let's see who scores. Let's see who scores our team. Oh, okay, let's read that again. Let's see who scores our team's first hat trick for the season. 
Uh, next match, I scored three goals in the first half and got subbed after the first half. Okay, that's more of a comment from Amin, I think he's saying about uh, creating internal competition between a team. I think, uh, I think internal competition is, um, as long as it is introduced in a very healthy manner, it's, 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 it's very important. I think it is important to have a healthy competition among the team to raise their standards. But again, you have to be careful how you introduce the competition because you don't want to create an unhealthy sense of rivalry within mm. your changing room. But by having a, a standard of competition and, and, and having that healthy desire to improve um, and to do better, it it's, it's equals high performance. It's, import, it's, it's impossible to have a high performance environment unless there is this healthy competition and this desire to do, to do better and this desire to improve certain things in order to guarantee that I'm going to be the one in the starting level. And an example could be, yeah, let's, who can score a hat-trick? Who can do this? That, you know, that, but as long as it is introduced in a very healthy way, which raises the standards, but doesn't add pressure, as we said earlier, mm. uh, then the unhealthy pressure, yeah. Then, then, then it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's it equals high performance. It's impossible to have mm. a high performance environment if there is no healthy competition among the members of that group. Impossible. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, coming back to service-based coaching or coaching with servitude, however we we want to call it, how how can we as coaches, how can we start to make a shift towards that in in wherever we are, whether we're at grassroots or academy. Obviously, you mentioned empathy, listening. Yeah. What what does that look like in a practical sense? Give us uh, examples. Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. I mean, for me, it's just been very, very authentic. I mean, it's, again, is a thought first that is going to trigger then certain things to become yeah. an action. And so, for me, it's very important to to just think, okay, why am I here? And, 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 and the minute you answer that question, then you are already becoming a serving leader or not. So if your answer is, why am I here? To develop these players, to make these players better, to make sure that these players reach their true potential, to make sure that we enhance their gift, to make sure we create an, an, an environment of, um, how Luke said there, competition breeds excellence. So make sure that there is a healthy competition so we all excel. The minute you answer that question, why am I here? In that manner, you are starting to be a serving leader because you are starting to put their needs and the needs of your staff and the needs of your team ahead of your own ego-centric approach, which is the most traditional approach in, in leadership. Um, so it's as simple as that. That will already generate certain degree of empathy, compassion. Um, you will have more listening skills. And then examples, when you go into the changing room, for example, and you go, well, we are going for training session. This is what we're doing today. If you want to present it before, some people don't do, doesn't matter. But this is what we do. If someone says, mm, can we do this? Or can we change that? Or why don't we do actually be, again, a position of vulnerability, say, yes, why not? Why, why would you do it? Well, that's, what, what, what makes you think that that's something that can add value? And then chip it and then put it, and then on the grass, same thing. So I think it's just being prepared to, again, that balance that we were mentioning before with that question, that balance between I show assertiveness, but I listen. And actually assertiveness is that, assertiveness is, I'm so confident about what I'm saying that I have no problems to apply constructive criticism within what I'm saying. I, in my mind, but obviously it's just because I'm such a believer of what I'm saying, of course, but in my mind, I mean, when someone is not capable of accepting feedback and constructive criticism, which for me is a gift, Yeah. When someone is not prepared to accept that, already is showing me weakness. For me, mm -hmm. it's not showing me uh, that it's someone is strong and I stand by my beliefs. No, that's showing me someone who's a bit narrow-minded. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's important to, to kind of like, again, 
it's it's walk walk your talk it's it's important that from day one um do leaders need to at times make the final say of course do leaders have to say hey this is the uh, line and no one is going to cross it of course am i saying that sometimes you will have to kind of make sure that these are the boundaries of course of course i'm not saying that you go there and everything goes and they coach themselves and you know and we don't have a standards and everything goes. no no i'm not saying anything like that what i'm saying is assertiveness to me looks like someone who knows the dna that wants to put in the change room that knows the kind of values that um can benefit the changing room, but is prepared to listen to all the people and to listen to his staff and to listen to the players for the benefit of the team and to create a much more um, high-performance environment within that changing room. The minute you stop listening and you just get very narrow-minded um, and you just want to do things your own way, for me, you're showing that you prefer to stay in your comfort zone, you don't want to be challenged, Therefore, you are a bit narrow-minded. Therefore, you are weak. Uh, because for me, strength and, is, and someone is strong is someone who is prepared to question himself or herself in a daily basis. Because that will be the only way to create growth. Yeah, I think it's like uh, just the, the more open-minded people are, the more curious they are, the more they're seeing what works, what doesn't, because they always want to get better. You said like they want to grow. They want to find if there is a better way, the, a better 1% that they can add to their game or to their uh, coaching process. So yeah, take take that on board completely. Um, another comment here. Excellent point of constructive criticism brings us full circle to an original point of understanding identity and personal traits. Yeah, agree. Awesome. Okay. Guys, any other questions? Uh, bring them in. Otherwise, we'll bring this in for landing. Um any any last comments, Edu? I think we've covered quite a lot there. Is yeah, there anything to, you've missed or no? Uh, no, to be fair, not really. I mean, I I, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me this opportunity because sometimes when, you, when 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 we do these things, um, it becomes very much like PowerPoint, uh, and you know, and and sometimes we lose this possibility in a way, guys, without realizing it. Thanks to you, obviously, your questions and. Uh, and your comments, uh, which, by the way, are very appreciated. Um, we, we've created a, a kind of like Indaba, uh, <laughs> like a virtual Indaba. Yep. Uh, uh, and, and I think that is very good because you guys have loads of uh, expertise and loads of knowledge and loads of things that I can learn from as well. And sometimes when we do these, these kind of like uh, webinars and so on, uh, th there is very much a lot of, well, here, here is the expert who knows everything and here is the PowerPoint and you have to follow this and this is going to make you, you know, outstanding. And sometimes it's just having these reflections. I mean, you've, your questions have been excellent. I'm, uh, you've made me think about th certain things that I might not have thought about it for a few months. Be uh, and now I'm like, and tomorrow I'm going to go into a training ground. I'm probably going to be sharper thanks to your questions because I'm thinking, wow, yeah, to be fair, yeah, we haven't done this for a while. Or I haven't reflected about this. So, yeah, thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed that. Brilliant. Well, guys, thanks for attending. Thanks for spending your Sunday with us. Uh, Edu, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and, and your kind of vision, sharing a few pictures as well that really helped bring some clarity to, to what you're trying to get across there. Sure. And I think, yeah, this is this is the future for me. I, I, I agree with a lot of what you said here, what, we, what you've shared. So, yeah, I think uh, I guess, guys, we got a little insight into the into the future of coaching. At least that's my belief, anyway. So if you guys think so or disagree, let us know. But thanks again, everyone. And uh, yeah, Eddie, I'll leave the final words with you. No, just to say a massive thank you. And look, I'll I'll drop my um, Twitter there if you guys want to be in touch. There you are. Please uh, feel awesome. free to, to drop me a message over Twitter and create conversations and exchange things. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a great believer that we are never our finished article. So, you know, I can always learn as well myself loads from all of you. Probably you have amazing experiences. So please share uh, and be in touch. Super. Excellent. All right. Cheers, everybody. Edu, cheers. See okay, you. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. Take care, guys. guys. Take okay. care. Bye.